Well, good morning and happy Sunday. Uh, yeah, good morning, Frederick, but uh, not Monday to Friday. I'm Danny Gurry, and you know, it's funny, I um, wanted to do some information and interviews with our Board of Ed candidates, and as I got the idea and posted onto social that that's what I wanted to do, I was kind of surprised and then again not really surprised at the response so then i decided i thought better than me interviewing the candidates individually and cutting things up and editing them i wanted to give you all a chance to respond and ask questions um i have questions as well because i just recently had kids at fcps and um you know, I think the fact that parents, when their kids graduate, the first thing I felt was I don't have to deal with FCPS anymore. And that's not a great way to be because, of course, there are thousands more children entering FCPS every year. So I am excited to bring you guys as many of these candidates uh, interviews as I can. And uh, I welcome your questions. I will be monitoring them as closely as possible. But let's first welcome Raina Remondini. She is a candidate for the Board of Education here in Frederick. Welcome. Are you there? I am here. Hopefully you can hear me. Let me just. Yes, I can. I can. Are you? Yes, I am here, Danny. Thank you so much for inviting me to your show. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. And, uh, well, what I would like to do jumping into this is give you just a minute or two to kind of introduce yourself to people who may not have heard you yet and, you know, talk a little bit about what got you to this point in running for the Board of Education uh, seat. Okay. Well, I ran uh, two years ago in the 2022 race as well. Mm. So this is my second attempt at being on the board. And the reason why I'm doing this is because education has played a large part in my life uh, to the point of actually starting my own micro school. Um, and I also run a homeschooling cooperative because I felt so convicted uh, as far as what was being taught and what was occurring in our public schools. Yeah, that is, uh, yeah, I, I, I absolutely understand uh, why, what would lead you to um, actually doing that. And I think it's interesting because I think as parents, we're all like, we want to make change. And many of us are, would be terrified <laughs> to do what you're doing because you do kind of set yourself up uh, in a position of, you know, attack, unfortunately. And so how are you dealing with that and your family and everyone as well? Um, because we know, you know, I, I just as a, a person feel empathy uh, for you having to go through that. Yeah, yeah, you do open yourself up for, for comment, uh, that is for sure. But, you know, I am convicted by this. And so the negative things that people have to say doesn't really affect me because I'm focused on the goal, which is trying to make some sort of tangible, real change in the system. What I see cycle after cycle is people get into these offices and nothing really changes. Mm. And so I would like to affect change. I'm the type of person that where I see there's a need, where I see that a problem is is there, I tend to get involved, I tend to get hands on, and I try to find a way to fix it. So when I had my children, uh, my first son, my youngest son, when he was in preschool, we experienced a really um, great school program um, for pre-K and kindergarten students. Uh, it was a cooperative, Parents were involved. It was a great tight knit community. I really liked the way that it was run. And when it was time for my child to head next door to the elementary school, I found it to be completely the opposite of what I had experienced. And I didn't feel comfortable leaving my child in a room that was cluttered, leaving my, my child in a room that had 30 other students. Um, and I had a lot of concerns. Mm. And so, you know, I thought I've got to find a better way. I'm not just going to settle for this because this is my school district. So I looked at private schools. I looked at Montessori schools 
And at that point in time, they were out of our reach. They were beyond our reach, you know, financially. Right. And so instead of just letting my child go to public school or releasing my child to conditions that I thought weren't um, up to my satisfaction, I decided to take it into my own hands by homeschooling. And when I began homeschooling, it was a bit overwhelming because I didn't have any guidance. Um, but I found myself educating myself, reading lots of books, finding communities with other like-minded mothers, and I've never looked back. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, that is incredible that, um, you had that experience and, and were able to find a solution for your family. And I guess it, it's, unfortunately, there's many families who can't do that. So I can understand why stepping in and saying, we need to fix this for the 40,000 plus kids that are under the FCPS umbrella. And um, yeah, you know, I, I, to, I commend anybody who runs for uh, any office today. Um, I, I just think you're, you know, you, sometimes it's to sacrifice yourself for the greater good and it's sad that you had to do that but how was your so you had it was it three children you have three children i have six children oh you have six my, children yes and my first three daughters were in the public education system and it failed them miserably right. yeah we were in montgomery county we were in howard county we were told each time each time we moved because my family puts a high focus on education we value education mm. and so we would move when we moved anywhere of course we would research the schools in our area to find the best schools to place our children in we were told that montgomery county schools were the top in the nation we were told that howard county schools were the top in the nation and that's where all three of our girls went um mm. and i do want to say i do want to mention um that my my three daughters identify as members of the LGBTQIA plus community. Mm -hmm. So I am dealing um, with, with, with issues that affect transgender, gay, mm -hmm. and what have you. Mm -hmm. My youngest three boys are biracial. And so I am dealing with the issues that come along with that as well. Yeah. So it's not that I haven't had any of my children in the public school system to see that even when you put your children in, in what would be considered the top schools, the mm. highest performing schools, there still are problems. There still are issues with drugs. There still are issues with bullying. These are across the board in all schools. Yes, yes. And, and you know, it is interesting, you know, obviously, the parents uh, of children in FCPS, it's, you know, this is, they're looking right here. And, uh, you know, actually I, I was doing research to speak with you and the other candidates. I looked at other school systems and every single school system I looked at had the same complaints. So it uh, doesn't make it right, obviously, and you still want to fix the one you're in, but it's also to acknowledge that a lot of these issues are nationwide in our our society so it's it's they're gonna bleed into the schools and so i guess we'll focus on the what you if elected would have the control to fix right because you can't fix everything <laughs> although some people may want you to um okay so you turned uh after your three girls you turned to homeschooling and um how uh, I guess that kind of ties into uh, what uh, the voucher system or the you know credit system would work. Can you explain a little bit about your thoughts about the voucher system and how it would be implemented? Well, you know, like like we had discussed before, Danny, this is something that can't be implemented. I mean, the 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 Board of Education has no control over vouchers. This is a state level right. decision. But I do want the voters and the citizens of Frederick County to understand my position on this because a lot of people um, are focused in on this. And I am a proud advocate for charter schools, for parochial schools, yeah. for homeschooling, for school choice. To me, that all falls under the umbrella of school choice. And to me, school choice 
is freedom. And it's what America is based on. My personal point of view is that the public school system has become a monopoly. They do not have any competition. So when you come and you face that sort of scenario, when you're dealing with the monopoly and there's no competition, then that Goliath can continue to do what they want, how they want, when they want, without any sort of oversight, uh, that's why I feel that we lack a lot of transparency because the schools feel like it doesn't matter what the pushback is that they receive. I see so many parents that are up in air, so many parents that have grievances about things that are not as they should be. And they take these grievances in the right um, avenues to the Board of Education, to the superintendents, to the teachers, and nothing is ever done. So I feel that a voucher program and a, a good solid voucher program that's based off of what's happening in this county, I feel that that would be a wake up call for the school system because it would introduce competition. And statistics and the data has shown that when vouchers are in place in certain states like Arizona and Florida, what you find is these schools improve. It's quite the opposite of what most people would think. When you hear people argue about vouchers, they say, oh, you're gutting the schools, you're taking away from funding for the schools and we don't have enough funding as it is. And when people say that, I find them to not be quite knowledgeable because I have seen quite the opposite. Once you tell the school system that if they're not going to meet your needs, you're going to go elsewhere, then that, is when you see a change. That yeah. is when you see better programs, um, better better facilities, better um, resources for children. So yeah. it's quite the opposite. Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree because having owned my own company uh, 13 years previous and starting a new company recently, um, you know, the free market is very powerful. And when you compete for for the consumer, uh, you have to implement things that they want. And uh, yeah, I, I do I do agree with being able to have that power over that money that is being earmarked for that child. It should go to the school you want it to. Um, speaking of the schools, and I'm not uh, terribly knowledgeable about this, but I do know that uh, we do have a couple charter schools here in Frederick. Um, do you have any um, input into, I, I don't believe that they get any budgeting. Is that correct? Well, uh, I do know that they get some sort of, uh, they, they do get the, the a partial portion of what the school would get. Ah. Per pupil, they definitely don't get the entirety of that. It is a percentage. And at the same time, what most people are unaware of is that when the school does give that money to a charter school, it doesn't come without strings. Yeah. So at the same time, the administration can give their two cents. They can give their input uh, on what they would like to see done. Yeah, of course, of course, for sure. Um, okay, let's move to, um, I know, something that is very hot topic uh, in reading through the 500 some comments that were left about these uh, interviews is policy 433. I didn't even know, and my children were at FCPS during 2019 when this was enacted. Um, can you um, talk to policy 433 and what you as a, a newly elected board member uh, would do to address this? Well, you know, that that is a very uh, hot topic. And on my website, you'll see that I am anti-policy 433. I have an issue with, with things when it comes to pronouns, um, not that people can't have their chosen pronouns, but if you're in a school system, and you're a teacher and my child is in your class and they're telling you things like they want to be called by a certain name or they want to be called, you know, uh, he as opposed to she. As a parent, I feel that there should be some transparency and some communication and that I have every right to know what's going on with my child. 
I feel that when it comes to bathrooms, um, you know, there should be bathrooms for for boys and bathrooms for girls. I have a, a hard time um, thinking about what that entails when you have boys and girls bathrooms and boys and girls locker rooms, whether they identify as boys or not, if they were biologically born as a male, if they have male body parts, I do not feel that this is this is appropriate. I do not feel that boys should be on girls' teams. I feel like this is very simple. This is very simple. This is biology. If you feel the need that there should be a different bathroom, then by all means, then we can place gender neutral bathrooms in our school. Um, and we can have that in addition to the boy and the girl bathrooms. You can have your gender neutral bathrooms for those who feel that they may be a different gender than they were born. Yeah. Yeah, I do. You know, that could be a good solution for that. Um, what do you feel the top three priorities for FCPS are? If you were elected, what would you bring to the board immediately? I think they really need to concentrate on the state of these schools, the schools that are dilapidated, the schools that don't have walls. We need to focus in on the schoolhouses themselves. And then when we're taking care of the schoolhouses so that they're safe for our children, we need to really combat the overcrowding. That is a serious issue. It's a serious issue when you have 30, 35 kids in a classroom. It's a serious issue when you're dealing with asbestos in a school building. Uh, those are two things right off the bat. And then again, coming out of the DOJ investigations, knowing that there are still issues uh, that need to be addressed. Just last year, uh, two years ago, March 2022, one of our special ed students, that's, you know, these students, some of these students are being shipped out to other districts and counties. Uh, broke his leg as he was being restrained by staff. Now, what that says to me is one, that staff is not properly trained in restraining. Uh, and two, why is it that we're outsourcing our special education students? Why is it that they have to travel as far as Baltimore County and Baltimore City to be housed? So these three things, special education, which definitely needs more transparency, uh, fixing of our schools, the ones that are just in need of repair, and uh, thirdly, taking care of the overcrowding and the oversized classrooms. Yeah. And I mean, I think that, um, so I know this last, uh, FCPS budget, uh, I believe it was, there was a $25 million cut to the budget, which I believe when I looked last is at $900 million for our County. Um, which I mean, seems like a lot of money to me, <laughs> but, um, why is it when that budget gets cut, the first thing that seems to get cut are the wages for our teachers and the, the things that I feel like as a, a constituent of this county, it doesn't seem like we're cutting the fluff. We, we're not cutting where the excess really is. Like, I feel like when you look on that who's making what list that the superintendents and there are, you know, people at central office that seem to me to not be as necess necessary as, you know, our teachers bringing in good teachers who want to work in this county and they're not going elsewhere. Oh, absolutely. I think that, you know, they fail to to recognize what is the bread and butter of this system. The teachers are the heart of this school system. Teachers work really hard. They spend a lot of years in college, you know, learning their profession and getting their certifications. And then they come and they're disrespected. The whole profession as a whole, this noble profession as a whole has just been, you know, uh, decimated. It's just what needs to be the focus are the students and the teachers. And the problem is, is that they're not the focus. And I couldn't agree with you more that the bloated budget, if you take a look at of where the money is really going, it's going towards the bureaucracy and the administration. And that's just a shame. And I think that more attention needs to be put towards that because we have to cut out the fat. 
And so I agree, teachers need to be paid more. Teachers need to be able to do their job. There's a lot that teachers are handicapped with right now. Their hands are tied behind their back. They can't discipline these children. They're forced to pass these children. They're being put into professional development classes that are giving them all sorts of propaganda and, 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 and left and right of what they should teach and how they should teach in their classrooms. And it seems to me that in Frederick County Public Schools, some of these um, outside groups that are consultants, they're, they're leading us astray. The policies are not working. They're failed policies. It's not effective in the classrooms. And we need to get back to basics. We have to strip everything away and get back to basics. The schoolhouse is meant for one thing, and that's to educate our children. Everything else outside of that needs to be reassessed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, especially because a report that I read said that I believe there are, uh, we're only graduating 70% of kids are college or career ready. Uh, that's, that's a frightening number. And uh, the fact that 30% of our kids are graduating but are neither college nor career ready, I think that that goes to uh, what you're discussing. Um, you know, what, uh, if you were elected, um, how do you propose working with people who have been on the board for a while, who may not have the same opinions? You know, how do you feel like uh, you would be able to be successful in, in working with everyone? Well, I, I tell you that, you know, a lot of times you can't, you can't argue with logic. If you come with it from a rational position, if you come with it with data and statistics and you come based on what's actually, what's actually happening in the schools, we need to listen to the teachers. We need to listen to the students when they come uh, before the board and not think that these outside consultant groups have all of the answers. I think that right now the board is listening too much to the consultants instead of the teachers and the actual students and the parents. Mm. You have to see the boots on the ground, the teachers who are in there day in and day out. I just did a forum not too long ago with my other candidates and the question that they asked us was about teacher autonomy. And of course, all of them, and, and mind you, only three of us, only three candidates are actual teachers or have experience teaching in the classroom. So the majority of them said, yeah, we should let teachers do whatever they want. I believe in teacher autonomy. I believe in this and I believe in that. They should be able to teach um, how they feel. And when I listen to them say these things, I realized right then and there that they don't have a true understanding of what goes on in a classroom. They don't have a true understanding of what teachers are really dealing with. I think one of the qualifiers for being on the board is to have a true experience um, in the school and it doesn't necessarily need to be frederick county public schools but you should have some sort of experience uh, in that environment so you're not just saying what you think um you know is the right answer you're talking based on experience and so that's th that's my opinion on that and i come from experience i deal with students on a daily basis i deal with parents and teachers so i understand the real problems um, that we're facing. So I'm going to talk to my colleagues and I would speak to them in a fashion where this is just not, um, it's just not realistic. It's not mm. applicable to what's happening in real time. And if there's a decision to be had and my vote qualifies as a no, it will be a no. Right. I feel that when you go to these board meetings now and they come up with, you know, an agenda, everyone is yes, yes, yes. Yes, there is no differing of opinions. There is no differing of views. And we're not going to get anywhere unless we have some sort of differing of, 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 of the views and have real discussions. Um, if you only have, let's just say you have four liberals and, and two conservatives on the board. And again, I understand that this is a nonpartisan race and that there aren't any political um, views that are disclosed per se. But if you only have two no's, and you continuously have five yeses, then that becomes a problem because you still can't move the needle. Mm. 
Mm. So it is important to be able to communicate and reach across the aisle with those that are continuing the status quo. And I believe I can do that by bringing logic and rationale and showing real life um, applicable situations. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that the questions that was asked repeatedly on that thread um, was about teaching life skills. So where, and I, I'll tell you when my kids were at FCPS of a seven hour day, probably three to four hours was really learning. Um, and the rest to me, to be honest, were wasted on things like, uh, watching movies or, you know, busy work when they could have been learning things like how to balance a checkbook. What does it mean when you have rent? What, you know, things that our son who's in college, a junior in college now, you know, we we're trying to teach him because he ne he's going to need that very soon. How do you feel about the current curriculum, time spent in school and not coming out, uh, at least understanding some basic things about life in general? Well, what I have been told by numerous teachers is that they find it hard to teach in the classroom because it's so disruptive. <laughs> um, and a lot of times I have specific ELL teachers whose most of their curriculum has to do with textbooks and, and reading and um, and so forth. I've had stories where they've told me that they've given assignments for focus time, 60 minute, 90 minute focus time. And a lot of their students refuse to read. Either they can't read or they won't read. And so he found himself um, having to show movies because that was the only way he mm. could get their attention. And most times he couldn't even um, get their attention with the movies. So I see that a lot of teachers are struggling in the classroom because they have students that are one or three grades behind. So if you're a calculus teacher and you have someone in your class that's been pushed along and has been, you know, they, they don't even have a basic understanding of algebra, but yet they're in your calculus class, as a teacher, there's not much you can do with that student. A lot of teachers are finding that they're being put in a position where they have to bring these students up to grade level, because believe me, they're not at grade level. And that's why seven out of 10 of them cannot pass the, the test mm. for graduation, because we in some way have failed them by giving them the foundations. And what the administration does is the administration points fingers at the teachers where the teachers are trying their best um, so it's just this cyclical dog chasing its tail because you have you have a disconnect. Yeah. And I believe that what we should do is definitely teach financial literacy. That definitely should be something that's included because in my opinion, that's no different than the need for career and technology centers. The whole purpose of the schoolhouse is to prepare our children to be good citizens for the world for that they have for them to have a vocation for them to be educated about our government our history to be able to proficiently do math and science to be able to go out there and get a job but a lot of these kids are graduating from school or graduating from high school and they can't continue on to um college or or university because they can barely make it in our community colleges because they don't have the foundation that they should have had from high school. Where you see these teachers are pushing these kids along, putting A's on their papers, B's on their, on their paper, these kids haven't done the work. They haven't put in the work to earn those A's and to earn those B's. So when they get to college, they don't understand why they're not doing well. They don't understand why they're not keeping up with the class. And that's because we failed them in elementary school, yeah. in middle school, and in high school. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And that's, uh, yeah, I, I can totally see that uh, point of view. Um, 
The uh, a couple questions came up about the books that are available to our children in both school libraries, or, well, mostly school libraries, or that teachers are using. What is your thoughts on the books that are chosen or how they're chosen and making sure parents have an opportunity to understand what is there? Well, transparency is an all time concern. There must be transparency. There's, there's no other, there's no other way. And transparency only works for parents that are involved that are actually searching and looking. So you can be all trans, you can be as transparent as you want. You can put as much information out there, but it's only going to reach those parents that are actually involved and care to look and see what's being, being relayed um, to them. You can put this on the FCPS website. You can give them all of the information about the books that are approved, the books that are on the list, but it takes a parent being involved to see these lists, to see if they have anything um, that is not um, in their, what, what would I say, in their belief systems. Each family has their own belief system. Each family has their own idea of what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. I don't think any book should be banned I'm not one for book burning. I believe that this is America. And again, we have freedoms and that's my bottom line. There should be freedoms to have every book there is available. But if you don't want your child to have access or be exposed to those books, then parents should take the time to educate themselves and to make sure that librarians do not make that accessible to their children. Now, when it comes to other things such as pornography, um, and just erotic um, images and verbiage that, you know, where you're talking about the N word and things that are just, just not acceptable. I don't think that you should have erotica or pornography in our schools. That is where I would draw the line. But if you're talking about textbooks and, and classic books, then there shouldn't be somebody that's judging what is and what is not appropriate because that is not anyone's place. We are all different uh, people from different backgrounds, different uh, walks of life. And one person can't distinguish what is good and what is not good for the masses. That should be our choice to decide what we consider to be appropriate or not appropriate. And if you don't like it, then it's easy enough for you to say, I don't want my child to have access to this. My, uh, my niece is a librarian and I know this is the case. I know it's simple enough to say, I don't want my child to check out these books. But don't, you know, if you don't want these books in your household or exposed, that doesn't give you the right to deny someone else who may feel that those books are appropriate for their children at whatever age they find them to be appropriate. Yeah, very good. Um, the um, issue with drugs in our schools, um, I've worked a few doors of basketball games and extracurricular activities. And, you know, the um, <laughs> when kids walk by sometimes, it's like, my goodness gracious. Um, what do you feel is FCPS's role in helping uh, whether or not we're going to help kids abstain, but certainly the kids that are affected by other kids utilizing drugs at school or on the school grounds. Uh, do you have an opinion on that? I think Thurmond is doing a good job. They have, uh, they'll have um, at times the police officers will come in with, with dogs. And, um, you know, of course you are given heads up. Uh, the, this is at the discretion of the principal. But, you know, if you have drug sniffing dogs that can come in there routinely from time to time, sniff the classroom, sniff the lockers, the bathrooms, I think that this is a good deterrent. I think that it shows that uh, the administration is on top of the, pro the problem, that they're aware of the problem, and it sends a message to the students that are are partaking in these illegal substances, that it's not uh, appropriate and that something is being done about it. And when drugs are found on the campus, I think that that child should be suspended or expelled. I think it's such a serious um, infraction that it deserves a serious um, repercussion. Yeah, and I do think that that has to go in line with some of the questions that parents were asking about uh, classroom disruptors, you know, as a parent of 
children who were probably kind of considered, you know, middle of the road, good kids. Uh, you know, I think our daughter suffered, uh, uh, well, the pandemic and virtual schooling, that's a whole nother topic, but certainly, um, if there are disruptors in a classroom uh, needing a uh, teacher's attention and it is being drawn away from kids who may be struggling and need that additional assistance, what, is your th what are your thoughts on how, you know, and I think this kind of goes in line with that teachers don't have the enforcement capability to, to do anything. So what happens with these classroom disruptors? Um, and, and how can we maybe address that? Danny, that's just backwards. It's backwards that the teachers don't have the authority to deal with these students. And like, again, I liken it to the patients taking over the asylum. You know, it's uh, everything, all the power is in the students' hands uh, and the teachers are left powerless. And some of these teachers are receiving um, threats. They're being spat on, they're having deaths thrown at them you know, physical violence. Some of these ch children um, are, are fighting and the teachers don't even have the wherewithal to break up the fights because they have fear. They're having fear of being uh, sued or, or having some sort of backlash come towards them. And it's a serious issue. And the disruption is not only students that maybe get out of hand, but you have these students in their phones where teachers can't even teach because every 30 seconds, there's a, a notification on someone's phone or the phone is ringing or there's a ding or there's a, you know, there's some sort of disruption outside of just ill behavior. Hmm. So what I would say is I would, I would take a look at something like a three strike policy where you have repeat offenders. You have students that will not pay attention. You have students that have no desire to learn or be in the classroom. They're only there to be combative or disruptive. Those children need to find another avenue. Yeah. First, I understand, you know, the first time you have these children that go and they leave the classroom and in a way, they're getting a break. They don't want to be in the classroom in the first place. So if they get a chance to speak with the, with the principal or they get a chance to have some McDonald's and they're talked down from a ledge, in a way they're being rewarded for their negative behavior. And I think that it's time that the administration takes a close look at this and they put the power back in the teacher's hands. We need to be able to do more suspensions, more expulsions. We need to be able to maybe recommend that these students go to a different type of school if they cannot follow the rules in the schoolhouse. I feel very bad about the child that does work the child that is doing well, is does their homework, wants to come to school and learn, and can't because they're being robbed because they can't um, get that focus from their, their teacher because the teacher has to deal with the squeaky wheel. That yeah. needs to be remedied. Yeah, and you brought up phones. That was a huge uh, number of comments on uh, uh, the questions that we asked. Um, how does FCPS deal with technology? It's only going to get more and more enhanced. Uh, it's only, I mean, I, I don't know what policy and I don't know if there's any school systems in the US right now dealing with it uh, well. Do you have any um, examples of other schools and how they're dealing with technology in the classroom that kids bring? They're integrating it because now we are in a modern world of technology. There are private schools that are now introducing classes for, for AI, for artificial intelligence. So we need to think forward, future forward. We need to think about how we can incorporate the phones. How can we incorporate the tablets? If there are going to be devices in the classroom, then let them be used for learning. If you want to be able, a lot of these cons, uh, consultants are saying, you need to engage the students. You need to, you know, you need to get them actively involved. Well, let's take a look at how we can do that with their phones. How can we use their phones and tablets to engage them in the actual classes that they're taking? As opposed to it being a distractor, how can we incorporate it so that it's a success in the learning environment? Yeah, uh, I agree. I don't, I think fighting it uh, as a parent, you know, uh, our kids had 
had phones in middle school. They were walking to school and we thought, oh, you know, we want them to be safe and be able to reach out if they needed to. But I get it. Like, I can understand the teacher's point of view about the distraction. But like you say, sometimes submitting to the fact that they're going to be there instead of fighting the technology, trying to figure out a way to work it in and engage the kids in a, a piece of equipment that they are obviously very comfortable on and enjoy would probably be the smartest thing. Um, let me see. I'm trying to think. Uh, uh, we've got some of the other questions. I think that got to um, most of them. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you uh, the floor, so to speak. Uh, oh, I actually, I do want to ask something. Uh, the school overcrowding issue. Um, you know, I think that um, it seems to come very late in the into play for families who are dealing with their children in portables and uh, in, dis, in schools that are uh, just, it's just hard. It's hard on the students. It's hard on the administration when schools are overcrowded. Um, what, what do you feel like can happen to alleviate some of those issues? Well, for the overcrowding, uh, some of the issues we need to consider more para para teachers. Um, we need to break down the ratio of teacher to students. Of course, they're trying now to do small group teaching. Um, as we're dealing with the teacher exodus and the lack of teachers that are actually entering the profession, because actually, if you look at the numbers, there are less people that are actually going into the teaching profession and getting um, educated to become teachers. So maybe we should look at being a bit more lax um, with parateachers and the, record, the certifications that are necessary. Now, I believe that our teachers should be certified. We should have teachers with experience that are um, in the classrooms. But at the same time, if we're open to community involvement, business partnerships, and maybe bringing in more parateachers who may not have as much uh, education or certain certifications as the teachers, perhaps they're working towards uh, their certification. We can bring more bodies into the school building. I do believe we need more bodies because right now we're outnumbered. Um, and so the teachers themselves, I feel, should be highly certified and educated. But if we're going to bring in assistant teachers, which would be um, a way to start a transition of helping we, you know, whittle down um, smaller group sizes and smaller classrooms, that would be a way to go about it. So I feel like we should bring on parateachers and also we should just um, take a look at community partnering as well. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. So for special education, um, Shepherd Pratt has a program where it is right now, I believe that they're in the Crest Hill um, elementary school. And what they do is they partner with the school system uh, when it comes to special education and children that are on the autistic spectrum, um, children that have learning disabilities, um, children that may have um, emotional uh, disabilities. And what they do is they go into these schools and for specific subjects where these children are, are struggling, they have small group classes, no more than you know, 10, 12 students. And so they're really able to hone and give these children one-on-one -on -one focus. And when these children are able to get to a level where they then can go into the regular classroom for instruction, then they're sent there, but not before then. Um, and I feel like this is a great partnership in the community, if we were able to implement this in more schools, then you would find that we wouldn't have such a struggle when it comes to hiring staff for special education because we have partnered with someone that is bringing in help and bodies. Yeah, and I, you know, personally, actually, um, when I first moved back to Frederick, um, I didn't go to college, um, but I have 25 years of experience in s certainly marketing, advertising. You know, I'd, I'd love to come in and teach a class. I think that public-private partnerships are so vital to a community just in the fact that introducing and working with the school to help 
Um, in so many ways, when uh, a, a business is able to get involved um, on some level, and then certainly, like you say, when you are able to relax some of the stipulations that if somebody meets everything else and then they can work toward that while they're a part of the system, um, I think makes perfect sense. Obviously, you're still under the guidance of uh, maybe a, a, a mentor teacher or administration or something like that. But how great would that be to get people with a lot of world experience or life experience to come into the school system? Not that there's anything wrong with the teachers who are graduated and just and young and fresh, but also, I think there's a different um, aspect that I think kids can get a really good gain from uh, just because somebody doesn't have a degree, I don't think uh, means that they're not capable. So yeah, for sure. Absolutely, Danny. And imagine if you expanded that to behavioral therapists and psychologists, because God knows after COVID with all of that, you know, with all of the loss of learning, with all of the anxiety, with all of the emotional uh, distress that our children are facing, imagine if we had more than just guidance counselors in there, we had a great team of behavioral therapists and, and, and people therapists that that our students could go and speak to, you know, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I do. I do think I really wholeheartedly believe that the uh, effect of the shutdown, we have not even yet gotten to the iceberg of the, the things that these kids dealt with uh, on their level. Uh, I just I, I just think that that is going to be a ginormous issue down the track. And so the more that we can ha show children that they can have support within the school system, I think is I think that's a good thing. I do. I think that that's a good thing. Um, OK, I'm going to give you the last five minutes or so uh, or however long you need to just let people know uh, if you know if there was anything, any one thing you'd want people to know about you, or anything that uh, you message you want to get across. The floor is yours. Well, first of all, Danny, I really want to thank you again for for giving all of us this platform. So I really believe that the best kind of voter there is is an educated voter, and I respect the viewers of your show and people that are tuning in and paying attention and not putting their heads in the sand because our schools are the most important institutions that we have in this country. Our schools are where we send our children, and as a mother of six children, each one of my children learns differently. Each one of them is a different human being that has different needs. And so when we send our kids off to school, we would like to think that we're sending them to a place where they are in a environment and they're safe. And I know that a lot of people feel that their children are not safe, whether it's because of school shootings or whether it's because of bullying and so I am here to be an advocate for change, to make sure that we can make our schools safe places again. And I know that a lot of people talk about equity and inclusion. And I want to say that every child has a right to an education. And it may not be what the public school is providing. If you find that the public school is not giving your child what they need, then every parent should be able to have the freedom of choice. I feel that the tax dollars should follow the child. If you have a child that's on the spectrum, maybe they're not best served in a public school and parents should have every right to either take them out of the system, put them someplace where they can grow and they can have a love of learning. Because right now, if you take a look at our schools, a lot of them seem to be like prison to pipeline systems. You have situations where those who want to learn can't learn because they're caught up in a system of being put in with everyone else. And not all kids are the same again. So I'd like to make a differentiation of with myself saying that one, I am a teacher. I do deal with teachers and students on a regular basis. I understand that children are different 
and that they all have different needs and that sometimes the public school system doesn't meet all of those needs. But at the same time, we can't make the school system into a one size fits all. So if you find that you're not being serviced in public schools, if it doesn't fit your child's needs, then you should have every right to go somewhere else that fits their needs. And for those who want the school system to work, for those who want the school system to, to get better, then I think the only way to do that is by making a show of, of action. If the school system doesn't improve, if the school system doesn't change, then parents should have an off ramp. Parents should have an exit ramp. I don't want for public school systems to fail. I want public school systems to thrive. I want for every child to be able to thrive. And, and, and when they graduate, I want them to be able to be proficient in reading and writing and science and math. I don't believe that that is occurring. And because there is such a fail right now, I wanna make a difference. I wanna do more than just talk about it. I wanna do more than complain about it. And that's why I put my hat in the race, this being the second time, because I'm passionate about education, whether it's my children in the system or not. I feel that there needs to be a change. And if you want a change to the status quo, if you want to see things done differently, then I would ask for your vote because that is what I intend to do. I don't intend to rubber stamp the failures of the school system. I don't intend to perpetuate the failures of the school system. I intend to listen as I always have to the voices of parents, to the voices of teachers, and to make a systematic change in the right direction. Well, I think, uh, I mean, I think you have wrapped it up quite well. You have your website up there. So if people want more information, please go to reynaramandini.com. Uh, and I'm sure um, you'll be hearing more from her. The primary is May 15th, correct? Uh, May 14th and 14th. early voting Early voting is uh, May 2nd to May 9th. That includes Saturday and Sunday. Okay. So I so urge everyone to get out there and, and cast your vote. Yes, for sure. I think the most important thing is look at the candidates, make the decisions for your children. Uh, you know your children best and um, you can't just go in blind. The, this, especially if you got children entering FCPS in first grade or second grade or elementary school, you've got a long road ahead. So having uh, the right people for you and your family at the Board of Education is very important. Raina, we thank you very much for your time today. And um, yeah, we, uh, Wish you all the best of luck. Thanks, Danny.